All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome. And thank you all so much for being here. My name is Rachel Linsky. I am a Boston-based dance artist. And for the past about year and a half, I've been working on an ongoing series titled Zahor. And Zahor is the Hebrew word for remembrance. And this project seeks to preserve the words of World War II Holocaust survivors through dance and to create opportunities for diverse groups of artists and audiences to come together in a non-religious setting to study and honor these important histories. Um, so the past few months of this pandemic, embracing the nature and the challenges of working remotely, um, dancing and creating art during a pandemic, I began a new research project. And I started this research project hoping to uncover um, and look into three things. And the first of these was I wanted to create a resonant and embodied form of Holocaust education and to bring in a new group of artists within the Boston dance community and to create an opportunity for them and a creative outlet for them. Next. I really wanted to experiment with a new creative process, one that would involve the dancers from the very beginning in the research, the reading, the discussion, and the movement generation stages, a process that would prioritize collaboration and create time and space to learn from my community. And I hope to be able to take what I've learned through this research project and use it to develop and refine my creative process in making future works for Zahor. Lastly, I wanted to practice leading workshops that combine Holocaust education and movement to uncover how I may one day lead such workshops with maybe youth, teens, even groups of non-dancers in order to further expand that embodied learning experience to different groups of people. So leveraging a grant from the mayor's office of arts and culture in the city of Boston, I hired seven research assistants to embark on this journey with me. I invited them to participate in a virtual five week long workshop series and then mailed them each a copy of Holocaust survivor Aaron Elster's book, a Holocaust survivor from Poland who survived hidden in an attic for two years. The participating artists each read Aaron's memoir and spent the beginning of our Zoom workshop series discussing his story, discussing themes of oppression, of standing up for others, of empathy, and we worked to uncover the importance of keeping these testimonies alive and continuing to study them today. Each artist involved with the support of our cohort has created a short solo inspired by a memory within Aaron's experience, an element of his story from his memoir that they felt compelled to preserve with movement and retell today. Each artist is going to present the dance that they've created and share with you parts of Aaron's story. And at the end of our presentation, I'm going to open up the floor for you all as the audience to ask questions. And you can ask questions of the dancers on their experience in this process to specific dancers about the works that you've seen. And we are also very fortunate to have members of Aaron Elster's family here, including his oldest son, Stephen Elster, who is a second generation speaker and has offered to answer questions specific to Aaron's story as well. So without further ado, I am going to pass it off to our first presenting dancer, Andrea Sala. So many, oh, there she is. <laughs> so many Zoom boxes. Sorry about that. Um, as Rachel said, my name is Andrea Sala. Uh, anyway, it is October 1942. Aaron is 10 years old and has already been living in a closed Jewish ghetto in Sokolo for two years. Ukrainian guards, police, and the Gestapo raid the ghetto, beginning the liquidation process. 
Aaron was pushed into a secret hiding room with 36 other people. An infant in this hiding room begins to cry. The group is consumed with fear of being caught and killed by the police guards and insists the mother quiet her baby so that they will not be discovered. As, I, as was mentioned, my name is Andrea Sala. I use she, her, her pronouns. And I created this solo around Aaron's memory of being in that hidden space, witnessing this mother having to suffocate her own infant. Please enjoy. I should include that this presentation should focus on the content and the art that these artists are sharing rather than my skills at operating Zoom at this point in the pandemic, which are still mediocre at best. So bear with me while I get this video to play.
De ce dimanche, l'enfant dont nous racontons l'histoire devait revoir longtemps le soleil fixe, le décor planté au bout de la jetée et un visage de femme. Rien ne distingue les souvenirs des autres moments. Ce n'est que plus tard qu'ils se font reconnaître. The group is discovered hiding in this secret room and are taken to join the other Jews being sent to Treblinka for extermination. Aaron's father tells him to go off by himself, to run and to hide. This is the last time Aaron sees his father and youngest sister, Sarah. My name is L. James O'Gilby. My pronouns are he, him, his, and I created a solo focusing on Aaron's memory of a small woman who helps him escape under the sharp barbed wire fence that surrounded the ghetto. In creating this piece, I focused on the energy transfer between Aaron and this woman. Though few words are spoken, there was so much that was said. After escaping the ghetto alone and terrified 
and completely unaware of what was going to happen to the other members of his family, Aaron began running, crawling under the barbed wire fence of the ghetto towards a farming village in Sabnia, Poland. My name is uh, Michael Valadaris. I use he, him, his pronouns. And I developed the movement in the piece you're about to see based on Aaron's memory of running through these fields, running away from the ghetto and lying down flat against the grasses to hide from passing trucks uh, in fear of being caught by the Gestapo searching for Jews. Enjoy. Once Aaron makes it to Sabina, he finds other Jews who survived the liquidation of the ghetto. Among them, two women who tell Aaron that his mother is still alive and where he can find her. Reunited with his mother, they begin a two-week journey accompanied by a Jewish man named Gedala in search of refuge. They find themselves at a neighbor's farm pleading to stay in his barn. The farmer beckons Aaron's mother into the barn to discuss, and when she emerges again, she tells Aaron that she and Gedala will stay with the farmer but Aaron must leave and find his own shelter, either with the Gorski family who are, hiding with his, who are hiding his oldest sister or with anyone who will take him in. My name is Alex Oliva, I use he, him pronouns, and the solo I made focuses on the moment when Aaron's mother tells him that he must leave her and fend for himself and the feelings of abandonment, hopelessness, and anger that Aaron experiences.
Aaron makes his way to the Gorski family's house and begs Mrs. Gorski to take him in. Reluctantly, she agrees to hide him for a few days in their small, dark attic. This ultimately turns into two years of being hidden there. My name is Julia Ty Goldberg. I use she, her, hers pronouns, and I created this solo focusing on Aaron's memories of the, of the conditions in the attic. Memories of lying down flat, patiently hiding and waiting. Memories of the deafening thunderstorms and immobilizing summer heat under the tin roof. He spends these years consumed by hunger pain, each day awaiting one small bowl of lukewarm soup. He notes that he prefers the soup that has sat out longer to the fresh soup because it becomes curdled and thicker and he is so desperate to feel full. Thank you for watching. Throughout his time isolated, hiding in the Gorski's attic, Aaron developed a way to comfort himself, a rocky motion that helped him escape his reality. My name is Carmen Rizzo, and I use she, her pronouns, and I created this solo focusing on Aaron's memory of him rocking himself into a trance, trying to escape his feeling of extreme loneliness, boredom, grief, and insignificance, as he nears two years of being hiding in the Gorski's attic.
After the war ended, Aaron left Sokolo and lived in an orphanage in Lotz. My name is Rachel Marchika and I use she, her, hers pronouns. And I created this solo focusing on Aaron's memory living with the other orphanage children, both Jewish and non-Jewish. Aaron had a great sense of release and freedom, no longer living in the state of confinement of the attic and finally being able to play with other kids his age. Aaron remains haunted though by the trauma and nightmares that he faced during World War II. We read in the book how this affects his confidence, development, and ability to connect with others as a teenager once he moves to America. Though it was challenging to constantly revisit those haunting memories in his retirement, Aaron becomes a public speaker and educator on the Holocaust and worked to encourage future generations to make sacrifices and take action to stand up to evil, prejudice, and hatred. Let's give all of the dancers a round of applause. I know I didn't pause between each one to make sure we could continue that flow, but as you can see, the work that they've done is really, really beautiful and powerful. It takes a lot of vulnerability um, to perform in the way that they did in these works. Um, for some folks who logged in maybe a little later, I know I sent the show program at the beginning, um, but I just wanna resend it in case you're curious to read more about the dancers who have been involved in this workshop series and their backgrounds. They come from very different movement backgrounds. Um, 
and have some experience in other things as well. Um, yeah, I'm very, I see it in the messages too. I get shaken up watching these works of myself just because it's so powerful the way that they perform in them. Um, so I'll give you a chance and for folks who logged in a little later, just to give you a little background of what this project is. So these works that we just shared um, are the creations that these seven dancers have been my research assistants in a research project to develop a new creative process for my ongoing series, Zahor. We wanted to experiment with something that would be more collaborative among the dancers. It would involve the dancers from the very beginning in the research, the reading, the discussion, the movement generation, rather than having them just come in and learn movement that I had created from my own research and generation, I wanted them to have that ownership over it. And I was hoping that it would lead to a more embodied and a more resonant form of Holocaust education. Um, now that you have seen all of the dancers works, we're going to have a question and answer session with the dancers. Um, and I'm gonna start it off with a question I would like for all of the dancers to share. But after that, you can ask questions to the whole group of dancers. You can ask an individual dancer a question about their work if something came up for you. And as I said, we also have Aaron's oldest son, Stephen here, who has offered to answer any questions about Aaron's story. And I feel so fortunate that we were able to connect, to connect via the interweb. Um, I'm really grateful to have them here. And as we go into this q and I do wanna say, um, I want everyone to feel comfortable asking any question that they have. So please don't feel like, oh, I don't know enough about dance to ask a question. This is a research project. I really want to learn. So this q and I want to know what you as the audience are curious about. No question is a bad question. I also want to include, um, as you can see what the dancers have done is incredibly vulnerable. Um, and that's what makes it so powerful to watch. Many of them have been able to connect with this work and emote from a really personal place, from something that they are very passionate about. And just in conversing, I ask that everyone be respectful and mindful of that. A strong goal of Zahor as I created this project is to bring together diverse groups of artists and audiences to study the Holocaust. And I wanna make sure that that really can be inclusive of everyone. We all hold a collective responsibility to remember. And I feel that we cannot effectively prevent history from repeating itself unless we can all come together and work together in that. So just something to think about as we head into the Q&A. Um, so my first question for the dancers, and I think I'll go, I'll spotlight you guys and unmute you in um, order that you presented, is you each had a specific memory that you shared with us that you created your work around. And I'm curious to know why you chose that specific memory, what resonated so strongly with you about it and compelled you to create movement, create a dance in order to retell that story and memory with us tonight. So let's see if I cancel my spotlight and I put Andrea in the spotlight to go first and I'll ask you to unmute yourself but I need to find your box again. I'm so sorry about the Zoom thing again. It's really about the content. It's not about Rachel's technical abilities here. Ask to unmute, there we go. <laughs> Thanks, Rachel. Um, so I picked the image of uh, Aaron hiding and witnessing all of these people kind of go into this innate sense of fear. And I don't, it just struck me as such a powerful image of this mother who she, did it almost the way it's described in the book the way he describes it in the book is that it's it's almost for like a greater good and then this fear washes over him of well if this mother can do this to her child what is my mother going to do to me and it just like is this domino effect that spreads throughout the crowd of human beings that he's cooped up with and it I don't know it just it just resonated with this like quiet chaos that was happening in this room while around him was even greater chaos and it was just a very powerful image that I wanted to explore. Thank you for sharing that Andrea. All right next I'm going to come to James to answer and you can um, refresh us too on which specific memory you worked with since we did see seven works. 
Um, so the moment in which I chose was the one in which Aaron um, met a small woman that helped him escape under the barbed wire of the ghetto. And the reason this moment really stuck out to me was because it was like a true act of kindness. He had absolutely no relationship to this woman whatsoever. They may have seen each other in passing, but ultimately there was this immediate trust and understanding for you know, how dire this situation was. This was his survival on the line and she knew exactly what she had to do to help in his journey of survival. And it just really like resonated with me because personally I strive to be as kind as I can and give as many acts of kindness as possible. But this was just like so immediate, so soon, so spontaneous, there was no planning. There was no way he could know that this woman would be here for him. And I like to think that if this woman was not there, he may not have made it out of the ghetto. He may not have made it through that barbed wire. Um, and this was a turning point because this was also his first true moment alone. He had never left his family members until now. So he knew that it was all up to him to get out of here to survive. And it was just like really just like prominent in my mind when I read it. Thank you, James. I'm going to come to Michael. Hello. Hello. Um, I was working with this image of Aaron pressing himself down against uh, the grass in this field uh, just after he escapes under the barbed wire and gets out of the ghetto uh, with the help of that woman. Um, and there was something for me about this image that stuck after I had read the whole memoir and was sort of reflecting on what images to work with to, uh, in, in creating a piece. I think I personally connect with that feeling of like hiding and really hiding and waiting and waiting and waiting to make sure that nobody has any idea where you are. I feel like I've, that's something that I've done when I was younger. It was definitely playful when I was doing it and it's not for Aaron. Uh, so I also think that there's something about this, like Aaron being alone in this field and having to contend with the fact, with the actual fact that any truck that passes by could do something unimaginable to him. Um, and so there was something about this particular image that really captured for me the atmosphere uh, of this period of time and particularly the sort of uh, psychological effect that was having, having on Aaron while he was 10. Um, yeah. Nice, thank you. All right, Alex, you are up next. So I chose the moment um, when Aaron last saw his mother, uh, which ended with Aaron's mother telling Aaron that he had to fend for himself and that he had to basically go, you know, find a place for himself to live. And that for me was very unexpected. I, I think like a lot of us have some understanding of what happened in the Holocaust some of the events that people experienced or went through. And so when I was reading this story, this was sort of um, a very unexpected event um, that I read. And it sort of um, parallels the, um, the event that, or the memory that Andrea chose. It's, it looks at the connection between a mother and her child and how that was broken um, because of the Holocaust, uh, because of the decisions they had to make in that moment. Um, and another thing that really got me thinking after reading that moment in the book was what exactly happened um, between Aaron's mother and the farmer when she went into the barn to discuss with him to um, allow uh, them to stay at his farm. And she came out of the barn and the decision was that Aaron had to leave, but then her and the other Jew, Gadala, could stay. And that just left me wondering like what exactly happened? What was her decision process? And we'll never know. Um, because she didn't survive the Holocaust and we don't know her like her side of the story. Um, and so that was just a very um, a memorable moment for me because of its uniqueness in the story. Thank you, Alex. All right, next I have Julia. Hey, Sean. 
I focused on the moment of, um, or well, many moments of Aaron waiting in the Gorski's attic um, through two, the course of two years. Um, he was there and, and the weather conditions that could relate to his psyche and it impact the conditions that were already so um, stark. But I think what really, uh, and what really caught me about it was the fact that he had to wait so patiently and that waiting I think can be perceived as a passive activity um and yet in this case it was so inherently active and necessary for life and the hope that was necessary in that um I I I, I then it got me thinking about the violent atrocities that I feel like are most commonly attributed to the Holocaust and to this time. And they're so, they, they stick out so distinctly, but then here's the, almost the inverse of that, which is still a, still a violent moment, but um, an extended one and a slow one. And what does it mean to actually just sit or lie there and wait and hope? Um, not to mention then the feelings of hunger and what that can do uh, to a person. So I just, all of that wrapped up um, and adding the component of a long length of time that uh, I just, I can't imagine what that was like. And so this was just a, a little bit of an, uh, an attempt to uh, experience just a bit of that. That was really beautifully said, Julia. All right, Carmen, I'm looking around my, there you are, looking around my Zoom. Hi, um, I focused on, um, well, there are also several moments in his story in which Aaron um, tells us that he was rocky himself, um, you know, comforting and almost getting into like a meditative state into a trance kind of situation. Um, and I specifically chose a moment in which he mentioned that right before uh, a girl he had seen from the attic um, was playing outside and she's convinced there's someone in the attic and she goes and in to the attic with her father and Aaron is in the corner and hiding as much as possible um, and the father like see there's no one here so that combination of moments for me was one of the ones who's, that stuck out the most to me because the rocky motion is a comforting motion. Um, it's usually done with children. It's usually done by someone else. Um, and that shows how in the sequence of events and not only in Aaron's life, so many others, um, children had to become their own adult, become their own caregiver um, and that for me was symbolic in that moment as well as the idea that rocking can also be soothing but also can be very anxiety inducing and how he had to find the balance between that and um, and also getting into that meditative state of like not being in his reality anymore being in a reality outside of his own uh, because the one that he lived in was unbearable um, and there's a lot of contrast, in my opinion, um, between the need and the want and the will to survive and do whatever is necessary to, but also um, not being able to live the way he wants to. He, he can't be loud. He can't scream. He can't live and, and put out that energy. Um, and then also the idea that when the father walks in, he obviously says it in a literal way, like there's no one here. He didn't see Aaron. Um, but I also took that as almost like a metaphor, like the being no one um, and what that meant. In his case, it meant survival. Being no one meant surviving. Um, although no one really wants to be no one. We all want to be our own person and have that experience. So, in just that little moment, I found so many deeper um, meanings to it, and that's what compelled me to create movement. 
That was really beautifully put. I love how much you took out of that one snapshot and moment, Carmen, and really analyzed it. And it's clear, it's very clear in the movement you created around it. All right, we have one more dancer to share why they pick that certain moment. And then I'm gonna pass it off to you as an audience to start to ask some questions as well. Sorry about that, hello. Um, so I chose the moment right after um, Aaron had left the attic and was in this orphanage. And it really stood out to me because the, uh, the way that he's sitting, kind of like the pose that he has, he looks very like casual and relaxed, like almost happy. And it just, it stood out to me because of the contrast, what he had just gone through this very, very traumatic experience and how he just seemed so calm while he was sitting there. And it kind of got me to think about how um, trauma and mental health and um, those sorts of conditions that humans face, we don't always see them. Um, they can be invisible. And that was kind of the situation when he's sitting there at the orphanage. And um, the, the trauma repeats for him later on when he, when he comes to the US. At one point in the book, it talks about how he was about to give a speech at a high school and um, he, he had like a panic attack almost because um, Aaron was so nervous to kind of like relive the experience as he was talking about it. So um, with those different kind of points, that's sort of how I shaped the solo. So I started, you know, in that sort of relaxed feeling just when he's at the orphanage and then um, those continuous times of reliving the trauma and what that brings up for him and the memories that he thinks of. And then at the end, um, he kind of comes to peace with it. Like he's worked through it in his mind and he's kind of found a way to be able to talk about it and to, um, I guess not, he doesn't have that panic sense when he talks about it. So it kind of walks through the different ways that he's related to the, um, to the experience. Okay, thank you, Rachel. All right, so you may all be wondering how we'll actually run this Q&A and I've got a few options for you. So if you have a question you wanna ask the dancers, if you know how to raise your virtual hand, um, there is a little, there should be something in the reactions. Um, so you can raise a virtual hand that may be a little complicated. It's a little, I can't even demo it because I'm not sure how to do it myself. So you can also put your name in the chat to let me know you have a question. And if you're like, I don't know how to raise my virtual hand. I don't know how to put my name in the chat. Just turn your camera on and raise your hand as if we were here together in person. And I'll just kind of go through the different pages of participants here to be able to call on you. Click participants and then press raise hand. Oh, thank you. That's for you all, not for me. Um, so let's see, I see Brian Perry has a raised hand. And then dancers, when you wanna answer a question, um, you can raise your hand as well and I'll look around to know to call on you. Let's see, ask to unmute. Hey, what's up? Um, I just first wanted to say uh, congratulations to you all because that was, that was phenomenal. Um, I've seen a lot of Zoom theater and a lot of Zoom everything recently um, and this one's gonna stick with me in a really cool way. So thank you guys for your work that you've done on this. It was, it was really, really breathtaking. Um, and the question that I have uh, focuses actually on the fact that this is over Zoom and something that you guys developed virtually. Um, something that I really appreciated was how you guys used the fact that the audience could only see this specific space and how, and how, and how you were able to like isolate certain body parts or use very specific uh, like camera angles and, and, and various other things. Um, and, and almost used the fact, you, like you used the, the problem of Zoom as the solution to heighten the, these pieces and bring them 
bring them to a further fruition. So like, if you guys, if any of you have specific moments that you'd like to talk about or like specific discoveries that you made with each of your pieces, um, the depth of field was something that was also really, really cool to note. Um, I, would, I would love to hear more about that. Thank you. All right, I see Andrea has her hand, so I'm gonna ask you to unmute and spotlight you to answer. Hi, Brian. Um, so I played a lot with keeping, I have what I like to call a uh, small dancer syndrome, where I've been told my whole life because I'm so short and stout that I need to be bigger in my movement. If not, I'm not, I don't like project. Um, so Rachel, she's my roommate and I love her to death. And she gave me this uh, challenge to be as small as possible. We also talked about it because because Aaron is confined to an attic or to make himself so small throughout the entire book. That's like a reoccurring theme is him making himself unknown and small and un invisible. So I know that a lot of us were like, all right, what little nook and crannies in our house can we find where we have to force our movement to be either internally contained in like something that's very, I don't know how to say it, but like pill buggy where it's like inside or to be so big that you feel cramped in the actual space. Um, and I know that was a fun little adventure for me, especially with also with camera angles, I was figuring out shadows and that corner that I played with. And that was a big uh, learning curve was figuring out, oh, okay, so I need an audience. Where am I placing said audience? Um, but it was a fun time. Nice. Do any of the dancer, other dancers want to share too about their experience working virtually or working in certain smaller spaces? All right, let's see. I see real life hands. Carmen, take it away. Yeah, so kind of going off of what Andrea said, like I don't have that much space to work with, but I did have a bigger space. And when everything started, I was like, I'm gonna use my bigger space because you know, we like to move. Um, and then one rehearsal, we were like, I think Rachel even said like, maybe think of a smaller space, like everyone just like, Think of a space at a key like maybe it's dirty maybe it's not I don't know so I look around and I was like I'm definitely going to do this in my room that's a fact because all the other spaces in my apartment don't work um like how can I make my room small and then I found this like corner thing that I never understood why it was there and I was like there's opportunity for camera stuff there. <laughs> so, um, so I played around with that and uh, that helped me also um, create my movement and bring that sense of like hiding and kind of not like I am here, I am not, parts of me is, parts of me isn't and all that stuff. So, yeah. Nice, thank you. All right, Elaine, I'm going to come to you to ask your question. Oops, sorry. Uh, well, first of all, you are such amazing and talented young adults. And I thank you for this gift that you've given us and hopefully that it will be shared with many other people. I also, and I put this into the chat as a comment, but I want to share it with you now. I am so, I am definitely much older than all of you, um, but I'm so very grateful that you took this man's story and created what you did through dance and music. And in the way that you did it, brought it again to everyone's collective memories because it is so easy for people to either forget or deny or ignore. So, having said all that, I do have a question um, and it could go to any of you, but I'm going to direct it to James because he's the only one of you that I know. 
as I watched all of you and knowing some of the backstory, uh, and it, it's such an emotionally filled story on so many levels, I'm wondering how you as artists processed the emotionality before, during, and afterwards of creating your piece. What did it do to you that then either inspired how you perform? How did it leave you afterwards? I know I've put about 20 questions in there. Sorry about that. My James knows it drives my kids and grandkids crazy. <laughs> Anyhow, that's kind of my general question. Oh, me mute myself. All right, Julie, All right. I'm gonna come oh, and hear me echoing. I'm gonna come to you. Thank you. Um, Elaine, thank you for the question. Um, it's an interesting thing and something I was thinking about before uh, we started performance this evening. Um, it's speaking uh, from myself, it's very easy to try. I'm of Jewish heritage, very easy to try to remove myself I think from the, the truth of the situation. I think intellectually, I, I feel very uh, in tune with with the time, um, just because there's some, I don't know. I, yeah, it just, there's, there's, a, there's a, a conscious awareness of it. And then the, the emotional part is something that really, um, it can be hard to attach to it because it can be so intense and so deep when you really connect the intellect, the, the thought of it and the facts of it to the um, feelings of it. And they're so in, intertwined and they shouldn't be detached, but it's, I think it's generally a coping mechanism, uh, if I'm speaking honestly, that um, that that was almost in, in the pre, that was in the pre thought of it. And then being in it, working through it, um, it was almost an allowance for some of those feelings to come up. And when the mind has to sit down and the body is awakened and is trying to deal with a story and, and uh, it was easier for my feelings and body to speak in that way because my head was not involved and I could let um, right. some of that be imbued in what we were working on. And I think that was one of the potent, um, or one of the one of the great reasons that we were using dance as a medium for this story, um, as opposed to a lecture series, for example, um, mm -hmm. it, can be, it just can be hard. It can be a lot on on the mind. Um, and then afterwards, I'm I'm kind of woo woo and need to like have a ritual to cleanse. I like lit a candle and like we just sort of let it let it be, let it live. It. Um, I don't know. That 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 was how I sort of approached it. But I think it's an interesting question because depending on proximity to the Holocaust and and awareness and what you mentioned, I mean, the ignorance surrounding it and and the denial um, that is so prevalent. Um, that that invites a whole other slew of question of questions and feelings. Uh, so grappling with all of that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so <clears throat> to also um, address the question of emotion throughout this process, um, going into it, I had knowledge, of course, of the Holocaust, but not knowledge of his story. So through the process of really reading and learning about his situation, um, naturally I grew closer to Aaron and his story and moments, especially when I was remembering them to create the work, um, brought up certain emotions that became more visible in my movement. Um, one thing that I kind of reference a lot is the barbed wire and in this um, 
I forgot to mention this, but he actually, this comes after my moment, but he gets pierced by the wire um, and he pulls himself under it, but he's still marked by this wire. Um, so he's still feeling not just mental pain, he is now feeling physical pain. And in my piece, I really tried to express that there is just an overwhelming sense of not necessarily numbing the pain, but trying to move with it. That there is still this current reminder. He is he's now alone. He is now, blood is dripping down his leg. He is really trying to continue to move forward in this next step so he can continue to survive. Um, and all of these emotions were kind of just like bubbling up inside of me, like, uncertainty and anxiety and it just like it over it overwhelmed me for a moment so i had to like definitely sit down and process and that was a big part of this which i really appreciated thank you rachel for putting in those moments of reflection and thought that allowed us to really add in the emotion to our pieces um but ultimately it was kind of like this relationship with pain, mental and physical, that kind of was a big motivation to create this work. And the beauty of how we can present that in our bodies. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, that's a great question and really beautiful answers. I'm going to come to Monica Steffi next. Let me spotlight you to ask your question. Hello, hello. Um, I just also wanted to say huge congratulations. Um, this is really important and meaningful work um, and you all did a really, really great job. It was inspiring. Um, I have two different questions. Uh, one being, what creative choices did you make that maybe reflect the story that you specifically chose to tell? And go going off of that, um, were there any specific or familiar movements that kept reappearing for you when you were going into your research and maybe even amongst one another? And I'm, I'm curious to hear about that as well. Um, yeah, I would love to talk a little bit about that. In terms of like specific creative choices um, in my piece, uh, working with this image of pressing Aaron pressing himself down against the grass in this field and really waiting for these trucks to go by whenever he heard them. Uh, the movement that I feel like I couldn't get away from was that motion of like actually just pressing myself to the ground and following something moving on the horizon until it's really gone. Uh, then sort of as our creative process developed, there was one uh, rehearsal we had where I sort of scratched a movement that was related to like checking over my shoulder um, and that got extrapolated into what it turned into in the actual dance. Um, but working with everybody in a collaborative way, I was sort of able to figure out that that gesture of looking behind oneself can sort of help translate this feeling of like, being watched and always being aware of, of sort of like how the society around you is perceiving you and could act on you um, in any moment. Um, and I, so that gesture was, I feel like a really good touch point for empathizing with Aaron in this particular moment in the story. Um, another thing that I just wanna observe and I'm curious if other people have thoughts on this, but I know there were like certain movements that I watched uh, that other people would do in their solos, other dancers would do in their solos that I was like, oh, I did that in mine too. It's cool that we had that same idea. Uh, so like Carmen and I, I think someone commented in the chat about this. We both have these sections of very intense running um, because that was something that came up multiple times. Uh, a couple of people sort of had prayer images. Um, and I think that that sort of a gesture came up a lot. Um, yeah. Yeah, Michael, you read my mind, bro. Um, <laughs> there, there's so many things that I also felt like I stuck to. Um, definitely the rocky motion. Um, I tried different shapes and different forms of that um, and 
kind of gravitated towards the very literal um, image that I have in my mind, according to the description in the book. Um, and there was also a lot of repetition in my specific um, choreography because there is the repetition of this movement. And I tried to alter um, certain elements of the repetition slightly um, to indicate like the passing of time and how every time he rocked himself, there was a different circumstance. Um, but yeah, there there are certain things that, that happen, like the running with me and Michael. Um, I remember the first time I think we we both kind of had it, and it was it was so different. Like there were such different solos and such different ideas um, that it was interesting that we both had a same turnout, like a same physicalization of of that feeling. Um, and yeah, we both kind of explored it in our own way. Um, I feel like the way I interpreted Michael's was a very, like a literal run because Aaron was running for his life. And in my solo, it was more of a metaphorical run because he was stuck in an attic and he just really wanted to get out of there. And whether that be in his thoughts or physically leave. Um, so it, it is. I also found that super interesting how um, we we start realizing similarities and small like connections between our solos, even though we worked in individual spaces. I have never worked physically with Michael or any of the dancers here, so it was very interesting how like um, even different parts of the story, different emotions, everything is is so like um, it, it still connects even though we're so far apart and like everything is so different but just art love art <laughs> that was beautifully said I think I have one more question I want to ask the dancers to close out our Q&A today um, and I want to ask a huge part of what we set out on this to do um, is uncover why do you think that it is important to still be studying the Holocaust today? And I'm curious to hear from a few dancers their answers to that question. We've done a lot of reflecting on it um, throughout their creative process. I've asked them to write and reflect on questions such as, so what, as they create their work. Um, and I'm really interested to hear what they've come up with and how it has developed maybe from when we first started our workshop series, as they picked the moments they wanted to create their works about and as they developed their works, as they shared and saw from other people. So who wants to, of my dancers, who wants to take on the question as to why they think it's important to continue to study the Holocaust today? All right, Rachel. Oh, let me, there we go. Thank you. Um, I think when we first um, kind of began this research process, um, it really paralleled with one of my classes that I'm taking in school where we're talking a lot about the history of jazz dance. And I think that, although they're very different topics, this idea about we must learn our history so that when we go into the future, we use our past knowledge, whether it's something positive or something negative, to have a better experience in the future. This idea of history not repeating itself, I think is really important. And just the fact that we understand how we got to this point today and what the steps were that um, had us get to this point so that um, mistakes don't repeat itself and that we create a more positive society. And I think it's also important to study and to remember so that we can acknowledge the people that have passed. Um, when we were having our discussion, we talked about how 6 million Jews died, but then there were additional 4 million people that died that were not Jewish. And so I think that this work is very important to recognize and just to take some time to acknowledge all those people that have lost their lives. Nice, thank you, Rachel. Let me see. Alex, I'm gonna come to you. Sorry. 
So for me, I think it's really important to study the Holocaust and understand it because it gives us an understanding of how we got to where we are today um, in the world because it wasn't something that just affected you know, Germany and Poland. It, it really shaped the entire world. Um, and like, um, like others have said, it's really important to um, understand what we are capable of to prevent it from happening again. And when you think about when the Holocaust happened, it was pretty recent. It was less than 100 years ago. And there are people who lived through the Holocaust that are still alive today. Um, and so it's not something from the distant past. It's something that can still affect us today. And that there have been genocides since, um, since the Holocaust. And so the fact that the Holocaust happened, but things like this are still occurring in the world, um, shows that it's it's really important and really relevant to talk about this and use different means that speak to different people like dance or theater or art um, to continue bringing this message to others, to have an understanding of what humans are capable of and have uh, an understanding of how to live in a diverse world um, with other people. So. Hello, uh, again. Um, I think this is just like an incredible question uh, to reflect on for anybody who has studied the Holocaust or wants to, um, just because I think the actual act of thinking about like, why should I do this is really moving. I'm thinking, Elaine, about this question about like, how were your emotions moved and changed by this process? And I have so many things to say. One of them is that, I think for me going into a space like this where we're reflecting on the Holocaust, I feel like all of the minutia of my life that's sort of like stressing me out just sort of goes away or becomes sort of insignificant. Um, not that it isn't, but just that there are much greater atrocities that have happened in the world and that continue to happen in the world, like you were saying, Alex. And if we can sort of look at those things and remember those things and, no and take note of like in Aaron's story, what were the moments where he was uplifted uh, as a person? And, and what were these random encounters that he had with people where he left it feeling maybe a little bit better, even though the, the society around him at large was sort of oppressing him and trying to, to keep him down. And I think we can look at those moments and say, oh, those are things that we can take with us, um, knowing that that bigotry in the world isn't going away. Um, another thing in terms of like why we should study the Holocaust, I think, and especially why we should study it through art is I've studied it through through literature, like sort of like psychological studies of Nazi doctors before. Um, and it's sort of incomplete to me to look at it that way, because I think for us to say that we can actually understand what someone's mindset was when they were committing those atrocities or receiving those uh, receiving that violence, it's sort of uh, stands under if, if we think we can understand that logic it sort of stands under that logic and says, this is actually like a possibility in the world. Um, and so I think exploring it through art and exploring the Holocaust emotionally like this um, and sort of searching for like, what impressions does it leave you with? What stories does it uh, compel you to tell and share and amplify? Uh, what random acts does it lead you to carry out in your own life? Uh, I think that's much closer to sort of like studying it in order to have a positive effect in your own life. Uh, I don't, it, it, I have so many thoughts about this. I don't know if I was able to say what I meant to say, but I think I did. That was really well said, Michael. Nice, thank you so much. All right, friends. So I think I'll come back here. I think I'm going to end with that. Thank you so much to the dancers for sharing your work, for your commitment to this project and for sharing so many of your insights and thoughts with us. Thank you to everyone who came to be part of our audience and support these dancers and who asked questions and helped us create this discussion. I do want, before we end, to share a quote with you all, um, something that I've come by in my research for this project and that has just really spoken to me. It's a quote from 
It's written by a group of Holocaust scholars in an open letter to the director of the US Holocaust Museum. And I'll read it to you. The very core of Holocaust education is to alert the public to dangerous developments of human rights violations and pain and suffering. Pointing to similarities across time and space is essential for this task. And I share this quote because to me, it really sums up what is driving this project and my own passion for it. I think often we can get into our own bubbles, studying only our own histories and almost becoming protective of them. But I think that it is so important to come together with an open mind and to study one another's histories in order to truly learn to empathize as you saw so much empathy in the work that the dancers did and create and spoke of tonight and to be able to stand up for one another. So I just wanted to leave you all with that quote and I'm going to share in the chat as well, a link to my website for this project, Zahor, so you can see past works that have been created as part of this project. You can stay up to date on future works that'll be created as part of this project. It'll keep going. There is still so much to uncover in these difficult questions. Um, but I just want to thank all of you, especially thank you to the beautiful dancers who gave their everything to this work, to Aaron's family members for being here in the audience, for all of you who have joined us in the audience today and participated in this and made it possible. So thank you all so much. Bye everyone.